let's go ahead and get started today. So unfortunately, as we get started, I, I do want to talk about contingencies for the semester. I know I, I put a lot of pressure on deadlines, but going forward, as we talk about the rest of the semester, like this virus stuff is very serious business. So if you're sick, first rule, don't come to class. Like take care of yourself, get better, okay? So that's the first thing, take care of yourself. Don't put yourself at risk, don't put other people at risk if you show any type of symptoms. I mean, there's too many scary things going on out there. You may have a common cold, you'll feel better in a couple days, great, that'll be fine, right? But if you have something worse, we don't need any more people in the community spreading what could be a very horrible situation. And unfortunately, we may run out of ability to do that and the school may end up closing. I mean, they're already closing schools out in the West Coast. I have a friend in another school, the vice dean, and they're already doing contingency plannings for shutting down their entire university. It's not here. But all I'm saying is we need to be pragmatic. I'm not saying it's going to happen to us. But if we get to a situation where we can't actually physically come to Van Munching Hall, three things. Number one, we're going to use Zoom, right? The university uses WebEx, but we're going to use Zoom, right? It works better, all right? So I did it the first week of class. When I couldn't make it on class, I Zoomed into the 11 a.m. section. Nobody had trouble, but I would just tell you, download and test Zoom, it's multi-platform on all of your computers, and if we have to do webinars, that will be the webinar. Now, if you lose access to the Bloomberg Lab, which would be a shame, <clears throat> what we'll have to do for the assignments is kind of like a variation of the last one, where everyone will just start doing the same company, and I will post data from Bloomberg from my terminal onto Canvas for everyone to use, okay? So as a backup plan, I know it would be a shame because I like the idea of everybody doing individual work on your own companies, but we may lose that ability later in the semester. So just be prepared that if, you, if, you, if we can't come to class at all and lose access to the lab, then I will have to put data up for you to do the assignments and you may lose access to your terminals, okay? Now again, this is only a contingency plan and I hope it doesn't happen, but I just want to talk about it now rather than later if it were to happen, okay? And then number three, <clears throat> in terms of the assignments, as I said, assignments are generally gonna be the deadlines, but if you're sick, talk to us and we will be more flexible relative to being sick, right? So if you're asking for, hey, I want an extension because I'm going to Denver to go skiing for a weekend, no. Like, I'm still gonna be tough about that, right? But if you're feeling sick and you're like, hey, I'm not feeling well, I need more time, Generally, if you talk to us, the TAs, we are going to be more liberal than we have. And we're just going to have to work, with, work through that this semester. So more information, as if it were to come out, will be posted on Elms under announcements. So continue to monitor your announcements for the class. Obviously, if the university makes announcements, we'll, pay, we'll follow whatever their guidelines are. But just please pay attention. Because my, my sense is, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm going to be. It's going to get much worse very quickly before it gets better. Um, on a personal note, five companies that I work with have implemented global travel bans in the last 24 hours. So, I mean, I mean literally, they're not letting anybody travel anywhere. Uh, if you watched 60 Minutes last night, even Michael Bloomberg said they're literally splitting the company in half. They're going to have people in some offices, they're going to hire emergency offices so that everybody isn't co-located anymore because they're worried about community spread. If you have a vacation planned for spring break, in the next two weeks. You need to monitor what's going on very, very quickly because uh, it's a very fluid situation, but unfortunately, we're at the point where it's getting worse, not better, and unfortunately, the travel stuff is gonna get worse. Um, <clears throat> you know, for my stuff, everybody paid attention, but like US flights to Italy got suspended over the weekend, so hope you're not going to Italy, <clears throat> and you could end up going to a hot zone, they might not have to let you back. So please pay attention to that. You know, obviously do the right thing, and that's the most important thing for you as you go through the, the rest of the semester. Now obviously that will have impacts on the class and, and the real world, and if you wanna see where the scary stuff in the real world is existing, I will point you no further than in your terminals. If you go to the 10-year yield curve and you graph the yield on treasuries, this is the yield curve right now for US government bonds. What's wrong with this yield curve? Yeah. Yes, 
So there's two things that should scare the hell out of everyone in this room on an economic basis. Number one, it's dramatically inverted, and that happened quickly, right? Why is an inverted yield curve bad? Yes? Yeah, so put it this way. To hold my money for one month, I'll get 1.4%. To hold my money for 10 years, I get 1.1%. I get less money to hold my money long term than to hold my money short term. That's exactly backwards of what is normal. And that's the point of an inverted yield curve. That, by the way, is why you're seeing all the headlines about the central banks, which control short term rates, are likely to drop the short term rates to try and get the yield curve to uninvert. All right? But here's the next problem. The 10 year treasury is yielding a little less than 1.1% right now. 1.08, actually, as, as we do this class. It has never been this low in the history of this country. Like, this is dramatic stuff. Unfortunately, in my lifetime, I lived in 2001. I lived in 2008, 2009. We are living through 2020. This is dramatic, and this is what we all need to be afraid of when we talk about economic impacts. And I'll give you an example. People are basically doing a flight to safety. It happened a decade ago. And what we started to see after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, and this is what I told you when I said the models broke, is people were doing risk on, risk off trades. And what the markets basically said is, I don't want to take any risk, go to cash. Sell everything and put it to cash. That's what's happening right now. People are selling everything and they've been putting into cash, and the cash is buying US Treasuries. And they're driving the yield to essentially negative rates. And here's what I mean. Today, if you were to buy a 10-year treasury, you get 1% a year for 10 years. What's inflation? That's negative interest rates. We are living in the United States right now with negative interest rates on a real basis. And very quickly, if people continue their panic buying, we can see nominal negative interest rates which could be really, really bad. So again, it's not the fear of the virus. It's the fact that nobody is spending money and the markets are starting to lock up because people aren't willing to buy anything at any price. Now, I hope this behavior changes, but this is what could really hurt our economy. And unfortunately, it's not helping when we see the anecdotal stuff. So for example, I went to Target over the weekend. I looked at the uh, hand sanitizer, all gone. Toothbrushes, the whole section of toothbrushes was gone, which kind of surprised me. But you're not going to find a mask, you're not going to find water, it's all gone. Uh, these are all empty shelves, <coughs> panic buying. And, and so that's the other problem, which is if consumers not only panic buy, they stop spending money. 70% of our economy is you spending money. And if people stop spending money, businesses don't invest. And right now, businesses are, think about this, if you're putting your money in cash, that's the equivalent of a payout rate. That means what happens to the investment rate? If the payout rate goes to zero or 100% because people put all their money in cash, what happens to the reinvestment rate? There's the problem. What's happening right now is companies are not reinvesting and they're waiting. Now, whether they wait for a few weeks and everything goes back to normal or whether this is longer term, that's what we have to start paying attention to on the economic side. But nonetheless, there's some frightening stuff out here in the marketplace <clears throat> that we also just valuation wise need to pay attention to. And, and I'll be very practical. Be concerned for your jobs. This is not the job market as seniors I want to go out to. Because when this happened a decade ago, what ended up happening is the unfilled positions started staying unfilled. So I'm not saying you're going to lose your job, but I'm telling you that your job, if you don't have one, is gonna get increasingly harder to close on because companies are gonna start deferring their hiring in a period of uncertainty. Because if I'm worried about my demand, the last thing I wanna do is hire a bunch of people. Now, generally, when we had the last big recession, they protected the undergrads that they hired for the companies that I worked with, okay? So they probably won't pull the job if you have one, but for the unfilled positions, those are the first ones that stay unfilled. And these companies potentially could start doing layoffs, particularly Wall Street. So I'm not saying it's going to happen,
but I'm saying pay extra attention as you go through the process. And if you have opportunities, just be very careful because it's gonna be harder in the next few weeks to get people to close on opportunities because everybody right now is dealing with uncertainty. And that's what volatility is all about. And that's what we're seeing playing out with stock prices, right? Unfortunately, even the guy that used to run the Alliance business is worried that the markets are up today, but he's calling it a dead cat bounce. You guys heard of that term? It's like the more older Wall Street terminology. But what's a dead cat bounce? It's a trading term. It says if you take a dead cat and you drop it, when it hits the ground, it pops up a little bit before it settles down. Okay? And what they say is beware the dead cat bounce when a market's in a bear. And so that's the point. You basically are having some traders worry that the short-term blip is may or may not be a good trading opportunity. It may not be a bottom. It could be a dead cat bounce where it bounces up a little bit before it settles back down. So again, don't know. This is what you guys have to figure out in your stock sense. But <clears throat> unfortunately, you've got to pay attention to what's happening with the economic data. I brought this up a month ago. I was hoping it wouldn't get bad. Every day it's getting worse. And eventually it's now affecting real world companies, real world values. By the way, that was your homework five. So if we think about homework five, which you just completed, T-R-E-N, these were the two screenshots that you had to submit as part of homework five. So the idea of homework five was two parts. Part number one was I wanted to take advantage of Bloomberg being here and some of the really cool stuff that they're showing us. And one of the things they showed us was this trend screen. In fact, I don't know if it was in your section, did they explain why this trend screen was really created and what actually changed Wall Street about two years ago with social media network trends? What was the company that changed the whole game? Yeah. It wasn't Twitter. It was, it was a twit, tweet about Snapchat. What was the tweet and who did it? Yeah. Yeah, and, and if you actually go to Snap's share price, Snap GP over five years, you can actually look at when she did the tweet and what happened to their share price right after that. This is the billion and a half dollar loss that they had when they, she said, I'm not using their platform anymore. And she was actually the paid spokesperson for Snapchat. So the whole point of all of this is this is when Bloomberg kind of said, look, social media matters, and to some degree they created this trend screen. This is very important to you. So <clears throat> there's two reasons why I wanted you to do this assignment. So let's go back. Reason one is I wanted you to take advantage of the cool Bloomberg tools that are real world. But number two is this actually plays into valuation. Okay? Because here's the deal. <clears throat> why are we doing this assignment? Why did I say look for negative news sentiment, and then find the same company that has negative news sentiment to have negative Twitter sentiment. And by the way, those would be the two screenshots. And what you have to find is the same company on both screens. Okay, so in this case, if I looked at worldwide last eight hours, I'm looking to see, do I see the same company here and the same company here, all right? Now, if for some reason I can't find them, I could change my time period or I could change my region. Like what I was saying is I actually changed my security list to the S&P 500, which made it easier, 500 companies. But if you look at the negative sentiment here and you look at the Twitter sentiment here, you're looking for a company that's on both of these lists, all right? Now, when I did mine, and I'll just switch the time period to last week, like one of the companies that I looked at was MGM Resorts, was the time I did this, was on both lists. I don't see them. United Airlines, is United on this list too? United Airlines. So United could have been an example company that you did. So they have negative sentiment, right? So those could have been the two screenshots, and that could have been one of the companies that you could have pulled out was United Airlines. Could have changed the region, changed the time, but I wanted you to find negative sentiment on both those lists. Why? 
How does this impact valuation? Why the assignment? That part of the assignment. Besides using blue books. Why is that useful information in evaluation? But how does that affect practically the valuation models that we're working on? Yeah. But I want to give it more practical about the cash flows. Okay? This is cornerstone three, by the way, which says a company's worth the sum of its future cash flows and the idea of intrinsic value. All right? And, and I want to talk about very specifically how sausage is made here. Right? Because I think it's important for us to understand that. Next week, assuming this conference doesn't get canceled too, I'm supposed to speak at the SIFMA conference, which is all the senior people at Wall Street are supposed to gather in Philadelphia, 600 of them. So hopefully that doesn't get canceled. But the whole point of the SIFMA conference is I'm going to talk to them. And as part of SIFMA, basically what we're going to talk about is one of my slides says, for the last 25 years, if you gave your money to a financial advisor to manage your money professionally at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or City or somebody like that, 90% of those people underperformed with your money the, the Vanguard S&P 500 index with fees over 25 years. Think about that. Professional money managers do worse, not just than the S&P 500 index, than the Vanguard index with fees. Why? Right? And the reason for the why is intrinsic value. In the short term, unlike the long term, long term stocks are worth the cash they generate. But in the short term, it's not about performance. It's about performance against expectation. That's what the Bloomberg Trading Sim is about. And that, in a way, is what this assignment's about. Because there's an expectation for the cash flows of United Airlines. And if bad news is coming out that's unexpected about United Airlines, that means the cash flows are gonna start being lowered. And if the cash flows are being lowered, then the value of the company will go down, right? That's what this assignment is actually about. Now, according to the book, which I know many of you didn't even buy, the academic research says that when news comes out, it takes the market a couple of days to absorb it. So. If you're looking at news that's coming out in the last eight hours that's very negative, odds are the market may not have fully picked up on this and there's a trading opportunity to be exploited because the short term has everything to do with performance against expectation as opposed to actual performance. Now increasingly, you're fighting algorithms. Like Goldman Sachs pays a ton of money to have their server literally next to the New York Stock Exchange trading server and they're getting the feeds milliseconds faster on the fiber optic cables than the rest of the world. And they're spending a ton of money for algorithms and very high-end computers to churn that data and turn it into trading milliseconds before other people even see the information. That's the, the quants. That's what the quants are doing, right? So our trying to interpret take this in the short term, we, we are relevant. The machines are doing this much more efficient, right? But there still could be an opportunity before the machines fully implement this to take over, right? That's where the sell siders come in, and they're also thinking about longer term impacts. But that's the idea of this assignment. So find a company that had negative sentiment. Now, the other thing I wanted you to do was just use this cool feature called Map. <coughs> so you would have hit coronavirus impact. You'd have come in here to United Airlines. And you would have mapped the company on the map. Now, United was kind of boring for the map because technically it only showed the headquarters. It didn't show you other locations. For purposes of this assignment, this would have been fine as a third screenshot. Like, just show me the screenshot, right? But I was hoping if we find a different company, for example, let's say we did McDonald's. take United off this list. So here are all McDonald's restaurants in the United States. 
So as I start to drill down, I can start to look at where McDonald's has their locations against where the virus hotspots are. Because my sense is when the virus outbreak breaks out, people are going to probably go west to McDonald's. And so I can start to see, based on where the hotspots are, whether or not that might actually start being the second McDonald's. Right? So I'm saying, like, some cool visualization tools. This was not necessarily your assignment, but this is, to some degree, what Wall Street's trying to figure out with some of this data in terms of how it's affecting company supply chains, how it's affecting demand, et cetera. Yes, sir? As I said, if you did more than what was required, that's great, because I just wanted you to start linking things together. Right? And I just want to make one additional tie-in to where we're about to go in class. And this was the other thing that, I'm trying to remember her name, Alatame, the other woman from Bloomberg. She gave us a very useful screen on Bloomberg. What was that? What did she talk about when she was here? Yeah. She was all the earnings estimates. All right. So let me talk about the earnings estimates. So I'll use United as an example. All right. So on Wall Street, there's something called the buy side and there's the sell side. The buy side, HDS. These are the actual owners, institutional owners of United Airlines from scrollable list from top to bottom. So I can see that these are the biggest shareholders scrolling all the way down to the smallest shareholders. All right? And 85% of United shareholders are on this list. So here's the point. If I am BlackRock, and I am this BlackRock, do this BlackRock institutional fund. If I manage this BlackRock fund, there are 4,500 companies in this BlackRock fund, right? How do I keep track of 4,500 companies in all the markets that they're in and all their competitors and figure out what to do? And the answer is I practically can't. So what Wall Street does is they hire their consigliere, the sell side, who are specialists in industries to help them decide how to trade. <coughs> That's the role of the sell side analyst. So ANR is the sell side. And the buy, sell, hold opinions of the sell side are not for you and me. BlackRock pays these firms to help BlackRock make the decision. So I hire Michael Linenberg from Deutsche Bank, right? And I pay for his research. So Michael Linenberg is on a team at Deutsche Bank typically of three people. It's him, it's an MBA, and it's an undergrad. And that's the team. That's the typical sell side team. And they are specialists in an industry segment, airlines. And they can decide as a team how many airlines to cover. The typical coverage universe is about 10 to 15 stocks. His team is covering 19 airlines. They select. Usually it's the big companies. They can decide how many little companies they do. More companies, more work for the team. But their goal is to know everything they can about these companies. By the way, if you want to talk to Michael, here's his bio. That's his email, that's his phone number and address on Wall Street. That red dot means he's not logged into Bloomberg. It's green when he's logged in, all right? And so that's another advantage of the terminal. You literally have the contact information of the top 300,000 financial people in the world. And if you IM them on Bloomberg, they're probably gonna talk to you initially because this is a system of record. Now, they might quickly block you when they figure out you're a student and that you're wasting their time, but nonetheless, you actually can, can get to these people. So here's the thing. What his team does beyond research to create the buy sell holds, he's got a hold on United, is they create spreadsheets and they forecast the income statement and balance sheet, thereby cash flows of United Airlines. So this is Michael Lindenberg's model. Now it's locked because you have to pay for his research in order to see that model. But if I pay for his research, I can see his forecasted spreadsheet. I can download it right here in Bloomberg. And by the way, what Bloomberg does is they take the 20 people that are the sell side analysts, all of them have access, and they upload their Excel spreadsheets to Bloomberg. 
wisdom of the crowd that creates the earnings estimate consensus database. More specifically, EEO, that creates the forecast for United. This is the baseline revenue, profit, and cash flow that supports that share price. And by the way, if I do that with a whack, I get the share price. So here's the point. I saw bad news on United. I got to figure out how much I adjust the revenue and margins of United. I change my model. I upload the model to Bloomberg. I then call my clients, sell United. United is down $2 today. That's actually what's happening with the sausage that's being made. Okay? So what I'm telling you is, I'm not saying Wall Street's right, but you have access to the baseline wisdom of the crowd best guess by people outside the company of what the cash flows of United are going to be going into the future. And by the way, that's the point. So in the short term, this sets the price. Plus or minus a little bit of this is reasonably what Wall Street thinks they're going to do. And for big companies, that's going to be the price. The way you make money is not to buy United. It's when new information comes out that causes them to change their guesses. That's the opportunity, right? Now, unless you're breaking the law and using insider information, it's hard to figure out whether people are going to be above or below the guesses. That's why 90% of stock pickers can't beat the market in the short term. But nonetheless, if you really want to be good, can you use the information to basically figure out, as information comes out, to be better than other people about how it will affect the company? That, in a way, was homework five, and that sets you up for what we're going to do when we do the valuations coming up after the semester. And by the way, the way these are created, like this is the consensus estimate for revenue for 2020. So of the 20 analysts, 17 have uploaded their models, and two were determined to be mathematical outliers for 2020 revenue forecast, 15 of them were remaining in the forecast. The high was 46.160 billion. The low <clears throat> was 43.51 billion. The average was 44.848. That's called the consensus estimate, and that's the wisdom of the crowd. So that's what I'm saying is this, and when these go down or these go up, are what's changing the values. And we can look at it on an annual basis, we can look at it on a quarterly basis. Right. Last thing I just want to mention here <clears throat> is that as you go out, you'll notice for revenue, when I go back to years, these are the number of analysts that are actually included in the average. And you'll notice I go from 15 to 12 to 6 to 1. So by the time I get four years out, there's only one analyst that is publicly showing me their forecast for United. Now, I'll be very clear, every one of these analysts in their model has a forecast going out multiple years. But the analysts decide what's publicly available and what goes into the consensus estimate because every guess is tracked. So typically, the first two years, by convention, everybody makes that available. But once you get past years three, four, and five, I'm less willing to make my estimate publicly available because what if I'm wrong? Because everybody's going to remember when I'm wrong because everything is tracked. So what they'll do is you pay for their research, they'll show it to you, but they may not show it to you publicly. So it's not that they don't have it, it's just you don't see as much in the consensus estimate. But next eight quarters, next two years, almost by convention, you'll see it out there. Matter of fact, the analysts want it out there because there is a kind of a crowd basis to this. Meaning, if I'm gonna be wrong about United Airlines, I want to be wrong together. I don't want to be wrong alone. So if everybody else starts cutting United Airlines, I'm going to tell my analyst to cut United Airlines and figure it out. Maybe we'll, we'll basically figure it out later about why, but let's go follow the crowd because we don't want to end up cutting or not cutting and everybody else cuts and then looking bad. So you do see a lead steer effect. And there are some analysts that are followed more closely than others because they're better at picking 
And those are the ones that really will move your stock. And it's not necessarily company specific because you can have an idiot at Goldman Sachs who doesn't do their job and all they do is copy everybody else. And just because they're Goldman Sachs doesn't make them a better analyst, right? And you could have somebody at Stiefel and they're actually really smart and they do their homework. And I'm saying the market actually starts to figure that out. So it's not just about the firm, it's about who do I actually think is actually really good at their numbers. And that's the point, even if I'm a Goldman and I know the Stiefel guy knows United better than everybody else, I'm paying attention to what he says too. Right, so essentially, there is a little bit of a crowd effect on this. But regardless, that's what you kind of did when you were homework five, and that's what we're eventually gonna do when you do our valuation models. So last point I'll make about your trading sim, this is your opportunity in the trading sim. Company has news, positive or negative. How much is gonna change directionally as the market figured it out yet? That's your opportunity. Two areas where it's gonna come up regularly, company reports earnings. Generally, when an earnings report pops up is the first chance where there's going to be difference against expectation. That's where people start looking at trends for was the company generally beating or missing their estimates over time and were they doing above or below. Not saying it's a better or not, but United generally has been beating more consistently over time. So if I see more negative news, maybe I'll give them credit for not hurting them as much don't know, not saying the past repeats itself, but these are judgments you can start to make. Second judgment is when you have other surprises that have nothing to do with earnings, like what's going on with the coronavirus. That's your other anecdotal information that everybody's trying to figure out. That's your opportunity with your negative portfolios of how you could do with the trading sum. Questions about any of that? Okay, so that was homework five. Let's talk again about next week. So, Monday of next week is the midterm exam. Okay, midterm one, seven and a half percent of your semester grade. Midterm one is going to be an economic statement conversion exam. Right? I'm going to give you a spreadsheet. You're going to download that spreadsheet. You're going to convert the spreadsheet. You're going to upload the spreadsheet. That's the exam. Okay? There is no write up. You're just basically doing the conversion during your class period of time, okay? I put on Elms, under the file section, a folder called practice midterm. In the practice midterm was a midterm from a couple semesters ago. This was the exam. This is the solution to the exam, okay? My recommendation, do the practice without looking at the solution, okay? So, that's the exam next Monday. Now, you are section 301, which means <clears throat> your class starts at two, was it two o'clock? And ends at 315, okay? So the exam, is anybody not in section 301 that's in the room right now? Okay, the way it's gonna work is the exam will be based on the section that you're registered for in Elms Canvas. So if you're registered for the 101 section at 11 a.m., you have to take the exam at 11 a.m. If you're registered for the 201 section, you'd have to take the exam at 12.30. You're in the 301 section, so you take the exam at two o'clock. The exam will open five minutes before the start of your section. So in your case, 1.55 p.m. <clears throat> the exam will close 90 minutes after your section time. In your case, 3.30 p.m. So between 1.55 and 3.30, download the Excel file, convert it, upload the Excel file, submit, that's midterm one, okay? No write-up. I will give you the one, two, three, fours, and you'll have to take it online. Yes? So up until this semester, I, was, I made it an out-of-class exam, and this semester I was actually gonna make it an in-class exam, but given the virus concerns, that's out the door, so it's an out-of-class exam. So wherever you want to take the exam one week from today, just make sure that between 2 and 3.30, you're taking the exam with a computer, with Excel, and a good, strong web connection. Log into Canvas, download the exam, take the exam, submit the exam, okay? Unless you have an exception. Now, in the file section, or the, sorry, the assignment section, there'll be another midterm called midterm alternative. 
right? That will not apply to anyone in this room unless you meet one of the I'm not taking it during regular class time exceptions, right? Exception number one was the student this morning who's in the ED, who's like, I got, you know, really high fever. Okay, great. You have to take the midterm exception at a different time. Exception number two is somebody has a university approved travel. They can't be here during the physical time of the class, so they're going to take the exam at an alternative time, right? Number three, you have the ability to take time and a half or double time based on the university giving you that ability to do that. So you do not take the regular exam, you would take the midterm alternative exception, okay? So to take the, accept, the alternative exam, you have to get an email from me with a password. Because when you click on the midterm, it will give you a password. Taking the alternative, unless you're sick, and we work out a different time, you can take it any time Monday or Tuesday of next week, okay? which is the 9th or the 10th. So the exam will not have a time limit and won't open and close based on your section time for the alternative. But you can't take the alternative unless you have the password you're pre-approved. So for the vast majority of you in this room, take the exam as scheduled during your class time. Don't even bother to click on the alternative exam. But if you take the alternative exam, put in the password, download the file, submit the file. You're on the honor code for your normal time. If you're taking the exam as an exception and you don't have time and a half for double time, you have 90 minutes from the time you start it to submit it anytime Monday or Tuesday. Okay? If you have time and a half or double time, <clears throat> you can take it anytime Monday or Tuesday, just submit within your time and a half. So you get an extra 45 minutes if you get 90, time and a half versus the 90. Now, the exam won't actually block you out, unlike the regular exam, but I'll see the timestamp for the start and the finish. So just make sure that you submit in the start and finish within that time, okay? So if you do have a time-based exception, you don't have to go to a specific place to take it. Anybody can take it online. Regular, take it during your normal section. If you have an exception, take it anytime, Monday or Tuesday, okay? Take it electronically. It is open book, open notes. Obviously, you'll need a computer and Excel. Two caveats, subject to the honor code. Number one, this is not a group exam, okay? So you have to do it yourself. You can't collaborate in any way. Which leads to number two. You can't go back and look at solvers or past exams other than the ones that I gave you. Because I told you there is a solver that you can purchase, that somebody created. <clears throat> and you can take the data, put in the solver, and get the solution. If you do not submit the same exact cell file, Excel file I gave you to download, you'll get a zero on the exam without any questions and a high likelihood of being in front of the Honor Council. There is no reason to take the data out of the Excel file and put it into any other file to do your midterm exam, none. So whatever file you download, create four new tabs, TFI, TII, CFI, EP. Submit the five tab file version back to Elms. Don't put it in any other file do that in 90 minutes next Monday. Yes, sir? Is it open notes? It is also open notes. So if you want to look at the practice midterm or what you had previously submitted for your homework, you're welcome to do that during the hour and a half. But you can't talk to anybody else, can't get their help, can't talk to previous sections, etc. Other questions? That's Monday, week from today. As a result of that, somebody in the 11 a.m. section pointed out that homework six was due next Monday. So you can thank that student. There is no homework six due next Monday. That will be postponed until after spring break. Okay? So your only assignment for next Monday is midterm one. However, on Wednesday of next week, March 11th, group case two. So group case two it will be presented on Wednesday, <coughs> March 11th, all day in class. At the end of day today, I will tell you the company and I will give you the data. <clears throat> Group case two <clears throat> will be the CFI and the ROIC tree walkthrough. That's all it is. You have 10 minutes to submit and explain a PowerPoint walking through the CFI and the ROIC tree. We'll practice that later in class today and in class on Wednesday. And I'll give you a little time in class on Wednesday to work as teams to basically work on the data because we're all going to do the same company 
But nonetheless, that is group case two. That is due next Monday, or just sorry, next Wednesday. Everybody will submit their PowerPoint at 10 a.m. You'll present just like we did last time in class, 10 minutes with Q&A. You'll do the clinical walkthrough, and very importantly, you're gonna get questions, right? And generally, the questions are gonna come from, if you see big changes in numbers, probably gonna ask you what caused the big changes in the numbers, right? I'm not gonna be ticky-tack, but if a company has a giant increase in goodwill, you can bet that one of the things that's gonna be on my mind is who they bought. And if you don't know the name of the company they bought, I'm taking points off, okay? Or if they see a big change in something else, why was there a big change in something else? Those will be the questions by which I will ask, as you saw, those were the questions I generally asked last time, okay? So that's what your team needs to do. Generally, anybody that's on your team can answer the questions, but you have to have different presenters than you did the first one with the following caveat. If for some reason we can't physically be here, right, because of the virus or other factors, then we do the presentations on Zoom. You'll present on Zoom, you'll log into Zoom, you'll share your desktop, and you'll present from your desktop, which will be recorded and I'll grade them remotely, okay? That's the backup plan. If one of your presenters is sick, then somebody else wants to present on their behalf. All right, and then I'll worry about the rule that says everybody has to prevent, present. I'll look as an exception if somebody gets sick, okay? But generally, whoever presented on the first one can't present on the second one. That will be next Wednesday, okay? Questions about next Wednesday? Great. <clears throat> After that, good luck on spring break. I hope you're actually able to have a spring break. Monitor travel. As I said, if you're going to Italy, you can't go to Italy. So other countries could start having travel bans. Be very careful. You don't want to get trapped someplace and can't come back. But that being said, when we come back from spring break, we're going to get into the valuation. At that point in time, we're going to start using Excel. So the Monday you come back from spring break, you will need to have Excel. We'll start building together a valuation model on the same company. So here's the deal. I'm going to build it. You're going to build it with me. You're going to submit exactly what I create, and you're going to match it. Because what I found over time is if I give you a model, you won't have any idea how it works. Or if you use somebody else's model, you won't have any idea how it works. The only way you're going to understand the relationships is if you build the Excel file yourself. So we're all going to build the Excel file. Once we build and value the company, then you're going to use that model to value all the other companies this semester. Right? Hopefully, that's the model that will then be group case three and will be your final projects on companies to be determined. I'll give you an industry, airlines, everybody picks an airline, you all do the individual valuations. Okay? The backup plan, if we can't have class because of the virus, I will post data on one company and just like group case one and two, everybody will do the same company. I hope it's not that, but that is just something we'll have to prepare for and we'll see how things go over the next few weeks. I'm just giving you more of an advanced look now because I don't know what's gonna happen in the next few weeks, but that is generally the plan of what we're trying to do. Monitor the announcements. <clears throat> I will still try and record as many classes and post them on YouTube if you can't physically be here. And if we do have to have class and we can't physically be here, it will be on Zoom. So those are just the three things to be aware of. Final part, group case one. A couple teams emailed me to basically say, I had people on my team that didn't do anything, and I didn't feel that's fair. And it's not fair, because everybody's getting a group case grade that's the same, and everybody was supposed to equally contribute to each one of the group cases. So the only choice I have now is to go back to the peer reviews. So I'm going to put up a peer review, and the way it's gonna work is that everybody for the group case gets the group case grade, unless one or more of your team members tell me that you didn't actually do the effort that they were supposed to, okay? So if one of your team members said you didn't put in the effort, and I'm gonna ask that, I'm assuming everybody's 100% effort, so at a scale of zero to 100, what percentage effort did they put in? If one of your team members gives you less than 100%, they said, hey, I don't even know who this person is, zero, I'm not gonna change your grade. But if two or more of your team members give you a peer review negative, I will change your grade. So if two of your team members say you didn't participate in group case one, 
you're going to get a zero for group case one. And that is not something that can be made up with the alternative assignments. There's going to be a peer review for group case two, group case three, and the Bloomer trading challenge, as well as the final group project. Half your grade are in groups. If you don't participate in the groups, you don't get the group grade. Being very clear on that. I hope this doesn't apply to anybody in this room, but regardless, that's what the peer reviews are for. So the peer reviews are optional. If you feel that everybody put in an equal amount or similar amount of effort and did their fair share, everybody gets a group grade, you don't have to fill out the peer reviews. The peer reviews are only, and unfortunately I have at least two teams that I know had this problem, where basically people just didn't do the work. And it is an honor code violation to submit an assignment that you didn't do the work on and expect a grade for that. So the way we're handling in this class is if your peers say that you didn't show up for the teams and you didn't participate and they couldn't contact you and you didn't do anything, then your name shouldn't have been on that project and you shouldn't get any credit for it. So I will take your credit away. If they did 50% of the work, then I will reduce your grade by 50%. But that's only if more than two people have that problem. I will just tell you, if I were you, talk to your teammates before group case two. Again, going forward, if people are sick, I'll understand. And your teammates should understand. Talk to them, because they're the ones that are gonna be peer reviewing you going forward. But unfortunately, we're gonna to have to use the peer review process this semester. I was hoping this issue wouldn't come up, but as I said, I already know two teams have told me this has come up, so I'm gonna to have to do this for everybody. Okay, so that's the final thing I wanted to mention logistically. Again, I'm covering a lot more today just because in case there is a reason we can't all be here, it's all very clear on what's gonna happen in the next few weeks. Questions about any of that, any of the above? <clears throat> all right, so let's talk about what you're gonna do in group case two. So in the file section, I also created a folder called historical file examples. In here, are four files. These two files are McDonald's, which we've already talked about a few weeks ago when we did the historical walkthrough. On a previous midterm exam, I did Royal Caribbean. It was actually a midterm two, and it was the walkthrough of the CFI and the ROIC tree, which was an exam question. Now, you're going to do this for group case two. So, if I were to pull out the ROIC tree for Royal Caribbean, this make it bigger, is what you have to walk through <coughs> next week on Wednesday. All right? So we're going to practice right now in class with the walkthrough. And on Wednesday, we're going to practice more on walkthroughs with other companies. And then, as I said, by Wednesday, you'll know who the company is. I'll put the data up there, and you'll actually be preparing for the following Wednesday. But as I said, during Wednesday's class, we'll do some additional practice and give you some additional time to work on this as teams, assuming we have a live class on Wednesday. Hopefully we will. But regardless, want to do a quick walkthrough of Royal Caribbean. So if you're not in Elms, go to Elms, go to the files, download the two Royal Caribbean files, ROIC tree and CFI. I'm going to give you a few minutes, about five, to basically go through it yourselves and then we're going to talk about this. So this is not for a grade, but this is a dry run of what you're going to need to do. 